I'm Dr. Duncan. Welcome to Change the World Church. It's October 6, 2024. Thank you, Father God, for creating the world and just uh, all powerful. You make kings, you depose kings, you honor kings who honor you, and people who turn their hearts and repent and come to you. You want the best for people, but you're a holy God, an awesome God, and you will be glorified because you're the creator, and we want to repent and worship you and follow you with everything we've got, Lord. We pray for this nation, we pray for revival, and Lord, we want to be a part of it, do your will, and lead that revival, Lord. Just let me pray. Amen. Open your Bibles to Haggai chapter 2. Title today's sermon, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more in a little while I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land. I will, sh for thus says the Lord of God of hosts, Once more, in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of the nations. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of the nations, and I will fill this house with the glory, with glory, says the Lord of hosts, with his glory. All right, Haggai chapter 2. On the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai. Or I looked up the Hebrew pronunciation, it's Haggai, Haggai. It's a guttural Haggai. Haggai the prophet saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, or Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And who's going to um, unite the office of Governor Zerubbabel from the line of Judah and Joshua, the high priest? Who's going to unite the priesthood with the, with the king? And all of you people of the land, take courage, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. As for the promise which I made you when I came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while I am going to shake the heavens and the earth the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come from the wealth of all the nations. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give you peace, declares the Lord of hosts. On the 24th of the ninth month in the second year of Darius. So what year? It's 522, but what year, but what year does it say here? Yeah, second year of the King Darius. Good job. 
So it's in the second year of King Darius. Don't overthink it. Just answer the question according to the scripture. Have confidence. Look at it. Learn to steal your mind. Focus on the spirit. Calm your mind. Calm your spirit. Just see everything. See in a millisecond. Make a millisecond like a minute. Calm, freeze everything down, have confidence, listen to the Lord and the Holy Spirit and answer the question or the problem or, or work through the problem. You can do it with Christ. Just, you guys need to take your cylinders and just cool them down. Have that still peace and calm of Christ. So the second year of King Darius is significant because uh, what king prior to King Darius did God use as his anointed as stated by the prophet Jeremiah or in the book of Isaiah and ended up being part of well, the prophets. Jeremiah representing the prophets or Isaiah himself. And recognized God had given him all the power in the kingdoms. God blessed him. And then God stirred up his spirit. Which king prior did God use? Cyrus. King Cyrus. Good. So King Cyrus. And um, there was um, a... Now Artaxerxes is one of those names like basically translated the great king or some of some nature just it's a title you know like uh caesar or something you know so there was an artaxerxes between anyway there was one that wasn't as favorable one later that ezra had a good relationship that was very favorable but darius recognized or the Spirit of God was upon him and upon the people. The Spirit of God was moving. So, second year of King Darius, and, the, and that's when the Spirit of the Lord returned. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest for a ruling. What's going on here in terms of what have they not done? Perfect. Haggai 1 and verses 1 and 2. In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet, prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people, to the people, has the time not come? even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. And why did King Cyrus release them in 538, 16 years prior? His command literally was, go back home and rebuild the house of the Lord, the great, your great God, the God who's blessed me and given me power, that you may build this house, honor him, and pray for the kings and the people. Honor the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That was really, literally what they were being commanded to do. So ask now, verse um, 11. Thus says the Lord of hosts in, in chapter 2. Ask now the priest for a ruling. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with his fold or cook food, wine, oil, or any other food, Will it become holy? So that's a man-made garment and carrying around man-made things. So what makes things holy to the Lord? 
They have to be consecrated. So if you're basically walking around, they were instituted the sacrifice. They'd given things to sacrifice. The sacrifice was instituted. Uh, but they have not built the house of the Lord. So they're basically walking around, basically saying like, in the open, without a holy place of God's presence, without a holy place to put instruments, clean instruments, consecrate and put things away, make things holy to God. There wasn't a secure house of the Lord to maintain the consecrated things. So you basically... He's giving the analogy of like you're kind of walking around the open, like basically carrying things in your robe, is the equivalent of offering like open sacrifices and trying to worship without having a holy dedicated place to Christ. Is kind of what he was like unsettled, trying to kind of make things do. That that's the analogy he's trying to bring. I'll read it again. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with his fold, or cook food, wine, oil, or any other food, will it become holy? Like, can a man, can man, without obeying God, make things holy on his own, doing it his own way? Or do you have to do it God's way? Can only, only God himself can do things holy and only obedience with God is holy. That's the point. And the priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these things, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, it will become unclean. So that's the principle. If you're holy and you're obeying God, and then you're rubbing elbows with the world. And will you going out and rubbing elbows with the world yourself on your make the whole world clean? No. Only the unclean coming before the Lord in the proper way that the Lord has commanded repenting and being cleansed by the Lord in the way the Lord has set it up. That's the only way they can become clean. And then you work together wholly. I mean, there's plenty of principles of people from other nations being involved, even in the line of Jesus or Jerusalem. They come to God, they come to Jerusalem, and they get clean. And they become part of the kingdom. When Christ came, you know, a sheep, not the, the original sheep, were going to be included in our fold, and God wants all nations and all people. He wants, has always wanted all nations to come to Him. You know, He wanted Edom, He wanted um, Moab, all of them, just to go for Christ, go for God, and surrender and worship Him. I mean, how many nations were there after the flood? One nation, Noah and his son and his family. How many, how familiar were they with, with the Lord and his awesome power and the punishment of when you didn't behave and why? And Noah was a man of God teaching them. At a, I mean, look at that just courageous all abandoning faith, empty of self, filled with faith. God's like, build an ark in the middle of dry land. And he told him there was going to be rain. And he did it. And his wife didn't run away. She, she did it with him, you know. And the sons didn't run away. And the wives, they, they, they followed. And they, they trusted that God was speaking to him. And they got on the ark and were saved. He didn't knock out. He didn't. He didn't knock them out. He didn't knock Ham out on the head and drag him onto the boat. And he woke up 
un kind of semi-conscious with the lump on his head and was like, hey, you're on the boat. You know, he came on the boat. Or it certainly doesn't say any that he was forced onto the boat. How about Adam and Eve? How many nations? Just one formed out of God, you know? One family formed from the hand of God. Did man make woman? Or did God make woman? She was made from the Lord. Man was made from the Lord's hand. He wants everyone. And he wants you to be obedient in his plan, become holy before the Lord, and be consecrated. Okay, so verse um, 14. So Haggai said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, declares the Lord, unclean. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is, he clarifies, unclean. Why? But now do consider from this day on, onward. So because they're, they haven't been obedient and finished the temple. Now you say, wait a minute. Um, they had a lot of political trouble with uh, Artaxerxes. King Artaxerxes, the one between King Cyrus and King Darius, how is it possible to build the temple? Did God say, build the temple unless, you know, you have some adversity? Now you pray, and what if God says, stop? You know, for some reason you're being... But... There was no command from God to stop. And in fact, there was punishment for stopping because he took away, every time they tried to, you know, they wanted 50 vats of wine, they got 20, for example, or there was mold in the mildew and the wheat and holes in their pockets. They couldn't drought. He sent drought. When you start seeing things like scent drought, crops are not growing, things are mildewing, you know, when you try to work for yourself, and I saw this one time, um, you know, when I um, was learning how to tithe more and more and more, give more and more and more, I found the money that we try to procure for ourselves just seemed to dissipate. And then when we started just giving and giving and giving and giving until we gave it all, we found we we're doing God's will and had the same provision, but all the resources were being utilized in a way that the God wanted. It was you were fulfilled and full in Christ, and living water was here. Rather than, you know, friends saying they're shackled, they have golden handcuffs, they call them, or you know, or they're shackled to their work, or they're just chipping salt in a salt mine, or they're running on a rat cheese you know chasing cheese on a treadmill you know rather than fulfilling god's word and doing that and so it's just things dissipate if you think you can hold on to wealth i mean by the scripture is clear your wealth will then go on to the humble and the meek serving me who will be using it then to manage manage the earth that i intended in a way that i intended you know You spend all your time trying to maintain all your broken toys that you spend all your money on and frustration and trying to guard your toys from thieves and then they turn to rust, other people steal them and you die with nothing and turn to dust and then you end up in hell because you, did, you weren't persevering in Christ potentially if, unless, you were, um, unless you repented and went for Christ and were saved and persevered in the end, to the end. Not in the end, but to the end. 
Verse 14, the Haggai said, So this is people, and so is this nation before me, declares the Lord. So is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. But now do consider from this day onward, before one stone was placed on another in the temple of the Lord. From that time, when one came to a grain heap of twenty measures, there would be only ten. When one came to a wine vat to draw fifty measures, there would be only twenty. I smote you and every work of your hands with blasting wind, mildew, and hell. Yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. So one of the big themes today is there needs to be constant, okay, and continual revival all the time. I mean, right on the hills of um, the remnant, after 70 years or even uh, or even prior to that when King Cyrus released them um, and they came back and they got blessed with all the treasure and they came back to Jerusalem and restored miraculously even from that time period in 16 years has been decay and decrepitance and then you're going to see again there's you know they have to come back when Nehemiah comes back and tell them you got to get your act together you need to return to the Lord and, and obey why you know they instituted the festival of the booze and then you come back in Nehemiah later when they build the wall saying but you haven't kept it consistently since the days of Joshua since you initially started to do it then and even then when they took the whole promised land you know or Gideon won the battle or the Red Sea parted, you know? I mean, Red Seas parted, then um, kill, you know, all those plagues in Egypt, yet they were grumbling. So they, had to, they disobeyed in the wilderness 40 years, but then God allowed them to conquer. He took out bad, evil people, plagues, snakes, uh, ground opening up and swallowing people. They provided manna and water and quail. And then told them how to navigate um, all the troops they wiped out to the east of the Jordan with Abraham. I mean, giants. They're fighting giants left over from similar to the Nephilim, but um, other are just in that line of giants. Um, or at least giants from leftover lineage and was able to conquer all those then he parted the Jordan River right to allow them to cross over and he parted the Jordan again when uh, with Elijah in his mantle and then Elisha because he had a double portion of the spirit you know he, same way, used the mantle to cross back over. We got a song about that. It's pretty amazing. Um, Go for Christ, Hebrews 412 Ministries, you know. But all these things happening, point is, we need, well, the theme, one of the big themes today is we need constant, every generation, every week, every month, every day revival. And a, and a continuing renewing. You're like, oh, great, we got Go For Christ Ministries going. All these crazy things happen. Uh, we finally get Go For Christ Ministries and um, the Energy Project and everybody making up businesses with disciples deploying. Do you, you quit? No, it's got a. It's a nonstop revival at that point, right now, forever. Back then. So that's one of the big take-home things. Last week was, hey, Go For Christ Ministries has happened. Here's periodic tasters. And we went through a lot of points in history where a near Go For Christ Ministries, meaning it's close to um, just all out going for the Lord, biblical, living the Bible, just, just living Scripture prior to the new Jerusalem, you know, when everything's going to be restored. And he'll wipe away tears and death and Hades and the false prophet are going to be thrown into the lake of fire forever. Satan thrown into the lake of fire forever. But there are, today is 
the theme is continual revival. And when you do that, He will once again, <clears throat> once more, here, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea also and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and they will come with the wealth of the nations and fill this house with, the, with glory, says the Lord. So the, what's the point of the well? When does wealth function? When does economics work? When everything is done with justice, mercy, integrity, and grace, and everything's moving, and it's moving in the Holy Stream, Holy Spirit stream, when things are moving, circulating for Christ in a just, holy manner, that's only time economics function. Everything else fails. When it's used for wickedness, it fails. When it's unjust, and justice fails, when there's no grace, when it's just, you know, what happens if it's all a uh, stick and no carrot? That's called communism or socialism or fascism or Nazis or Muslim, you know, or any other dictatorship or socialistic regime. What if it's, what if it's all liberal and no following God whatsoever. Well, that's, that's the liberals. That's mayhem and liberals, you know? The basically just the wheels come off and crime and sin abound, you know? So the only way it works is if you're sold out for Christ and all that wealth and nations are flowing and circulating and moving. There will be only 20. I smote you in every work of your hands. This is verse 17. With blasting wind, mildew, and hell. Yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. Do consider from this day onward, from the 24th day, catch this, from the 24th day of the ninth month, So, Yom Kippur, which is repentance, is um, the seventh month. So the seventh month is when they have the Day of Atonement, tenth day, um, I believe, and then a week later, six days later, a week later, they come back and they do the festival of booths or sukkah. So that's in the seventh month. Um, so this was in the ninth month. So for uh, one million dollars for your scholarship fund. You have to answer these three questions, and you're not allowed to use any electronic devices, okay? So don't, like, research it. You have to just answer. <laughs> I'm trusting your integrity. Okay, how many... Um, you have to answer all three or four questions correctly. What... Or five questions. What is our... Um, in America... What is our current calendar based on? Okay, and what's what's that generally based on? What celestial body? Oh, I'm talking about our calendar. Yeah, our calendar is based on the sun. So it's 365 days of the sun. Like, it's literally based on the sun and the days moving. 
Um, Andrew, what was the Hebrew calendar based on? What celestial body? Or whoever? The moon. Did you say the moon? The moon. So, the Hebrew calendar is based on lunar. How many months does the uh, does the Hebrew calendar have? Twelve months. Great. Um, do they have leap year, and if so? How often and how does it work? So um, they have as you would um, they have seven leap years every 19 years. How do they implement that? They have an extra month. Their last month is called ADAR. So seven times every 19 years, they have an extra month. They call it a pregnant month called ADAR2. So there's ADAR1 and ADAR2. ADAR is 29 days. Every other month is 29, 30, 29, 30, 29, 30. So they go 29, 30 days. And then at seven times every 19 years, they have an extra month called ADAR2. It's 29 days. That's how they make their calendar adjustment. And for the final question, Years it occurs. Years 0, 3, 6, 8, 11, 14, and 17 are the years at the. So the amazing thing about that is it maintains the season. So if we ever lost. Um, we should be able to tell from, you know, the rising of the constellations and all these other things. But uh, one way to maintain the seasonal calendars would be that way. But the ma the amazing thing is, is their their festivals or holidays are kept seasonal, which are critical, right? Because you're honoring the Lord right about the time like you know women are very men are too but women are very seasonal you know and you know fall comes and winter and summer and spring the flowers are blooming the fall leaves are falling and you know men are like hey the harvest is coming everyone likes that the harvest is coming in that and then you have a time of atonement and then you have a time where you literally celebrate the harvest at festival booths and you know you get out there with your family it's also a time in the fall when it's reasonable weather and you build the booths and you honor the fact that God did all these things and brought us out of Egypt. You know, it's just remarkable. The Muslims don't do that. They don't, they don't account for leap year. And so they have all their crazy mixed up abominable days and, and, and holidays just, just random. And they just change all year long and then... You know, crazy stuff like don't eat all day and then gorge at night. and It's just, nothing makes sense. It's just a mess. For the final question, even though you had to get them all right for a million dollars, just for, um, final question, what does Haggai mean? Yeah, solemn, solemn, 
solemn festival, festival one, but literally solemn dedication to the Lord. Hey, you need to read. That's how important it is. I'm saying for this festival of booze and this, um, you know, a day of atonement, Easter, you know, um, the Passover time now, which, which is Easter and, um, even when the Holy Spirit came back down, you know, all those things, but, um, he's always been here. But just honoring the Lord in these ways, He's given us holy days and weeks to spend with Him and remember Him throughout time. And we need to honor Him. So He literally is sending Haggai, Hey, I am solemn, holiday festival, worship the Lord in, in these solemn holidays. Honor Him. That's the name of the prophet I'm sending you. Like, I brought you out of Babylon for the Sabbaths you didn't keep and, and all the holy days you didn't keep and Haggai's being sent to him. Verse 20, Then the word of the Lord came a second time. Oh, let's back up to, nine, to 18. Do you consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of the Lord was founded, consider, is the seed still in the barn? Even including the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranates, the olive tree, is not born fruit. Yet from this day on, I will bless you. They were just on total defense, total defensive, not able to get out, plant, expand, you know, grow, bless. Then the word of the Lord, verse 20, the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders will go down, everyone by the sword of another. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you a signet ring, ring for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Thank you, Father God, because you are that signet ring, Christ. You are the one. You destroyed Satan. You destroyed all the kings of the earth. And you overthrew everything as Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Everything is destroyed when you sacrificed and defeated death. And once again, there'll be new Jerusalem in the, in the ongoing reign of your kingdom, which has always been forever. But you destroyed it then, you declared it then, and you will destroy it with the sword of your mouth and fire and forever in your kingdom when new thing, old things have passed away and new things have come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. So obviously, he's referring to Christ as the signet ring and the heir of Zerubbabel, and God destroying all. Okay, Second Chronicles. So, you've got that in mind. You've got, we need continual revival. You've got the fact that he sent them to build the temple. Their holidays, he wants them to worship and honor him, and his glory restored. But he is a holy God. They were punished, as God saw fit. Yet, God shook the heavens and earth, and he'll shake them again. So he shook the heavens and earth with King Cyrus to bring them back, and then he's going to shake the heavens and the earth once again um, after that. Second Chronicles 36, 11-23. Following all the abominations of the nations, 
and they polluted the house of the Lord that he had made holy in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words, scoffing at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, until there was no remedy. Therefore he cried out against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword. In the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or age. He gave them into his hand, and all the vessels of the Lord God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and all the treasures of the king and his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burned the house of God, and broke down the wall of Jerusalem, and burned all its places with fire, and destroyed all its precious vessels. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his sons, until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill seventy years. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord came by the mouth of Jeremiah that it might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout his kingdom, and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you, of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. Amen. Talk to me in, um, in a brief summary or a quick summary, focusing on um, there was no remedy left. And then he mentions King Cyrus. That's pretty amazing. Ezra chapter 1. All right, let, can you read that last part about King Cyrus again, Andrew? Just that little blur part. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, but the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus the king of Persia, so that he might make a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus the king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him, let him go up. So he charged like the Israelites living in his kingdom to literally go back and rebuild the temple with his like good will. Amen. Okay, Ezra chapter one. <coughs> in the first year of Cyrus King of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus King of Persia that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing. Thus said Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you, of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor, in whatever place he sojourns, be assisted by men of his place, with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings, for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of fathers of houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit 
God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. Cyrus the king also brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Cyrus king of Persia brought these out in charge of Mithridat, the treasurer, who counted them out to Shazbazer, the prince of Judah. And this was the number of them, 30 basins of gold, 1,000 basins of silver, 29 censers, 30 bowls of gold, 410 bowls of silver, and 1,000 other vessels. All the vessels of gold and silver were 5,400. All these did Shazbazer bring up and the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. Amen. Here, let's pray. All right. Thank you, Lord, for this, this miraculous events and when you stir the heart of King Cyrus and he obeyed and just the restoration of the fortune that the evil gods were storing in their temple that return that to the Lord God with the remnant through pursuing you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Let's read um, Ezra chapter 2. Okay, chapter 2. Now these are the people of the province who came up out of the, ca out of the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon and returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his city. <clears throat> these came with Zerubbabel. Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Banna. The number of the men of the people of Israel. The sons of Parash, 2,172. The sons of Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Era, 775. The sons of Pahath, Moab, the sons of Jeshua, and Joab, 2,812, the sons of Elam, 1,254, the sons of Zatu, 945, the sons of Zakai, 760, sons of Bani, 642, the sons of Babai, 623, the sons of Asgad, 1,222, the sons of Adakam, 666. The sons of Bigvi, 2056. The sons of Aden, 454. The sons of Atur of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Bazai, 323. The sons of Jorah, 112. The sons of Hashem, 223. The sons of Gibar, 95. The men of Bethlehem, 123. The men of Netapha, 56. The men of Anatoth, 128. The sons of Asmaveth, 42. The sons of Kiriath, Ariam, Shephariah, and Biroth, 743. The sons of Ramah and Geba, 621. The men of Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 223. The sons of Nebo, 52. The sons of Magbish, Magbish, 156. The sons of the other Elam, 1,254. The sons of Haram, 320. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 725. The men of Jericho, 345. The sons of Sena, 3,630. 3, the priests, the sons of Jedidiah, of the house of Jeshua, 973. The sons of Immer, 1,052. The sons of Pasher, 1,247. The sons of Haram, 1,017. The Levites, the sons of Jeshua and Cadmiel, the sons of Hodaviah, 74. The singers, the sons of Asaph, 128. The sons of the gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, 
the sons of Atar, the sons of Talmon, the sons of Akab, the sons of Hatita, the sons of Shoabai, in all, 139. The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hesufa, the sons of Tabeo, the sons of Kiros, the sons of Shaha, the sons of Paddan, the sons of Lebanon, the sons of Hagabah, the sons of Achim, the sons of Hagab, the sons of Shalamai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Gahar, the sons of Riah, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazim, the sons of Uza, the sons of Pasiah, the sons of Besai, the sons of Asna, the sons of Mehuam, the sons of Nephism, the sons of Bakbuk, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Heru, the sons of Basluth, the sons of Mahida, the sons of Her Herasha, the sons of Barcos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tema, the sons of Naziah, the sons of Hatifa, the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sotei, the sons of Hasopira, the sons of Peruda, the sons of Jahal, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Hatiel, the sons of Potaretha Hasbam, the sons of Ammi, the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. Now these are those who came up from Tel Mala, Tel Harasha, Cherub, Aden, and Imner, but they were not able to give evidence of their father's households and their descendants, whether they were of Israel. The sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 652. Of the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Hakaz, the sons of Barzillai, who took a wife from the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and he was called by their name. These searched among their ancestral registration, but they could not be located. Therefore they were considered unclean and excluded from the priesthood. The governor said to them that they should not eat from the most holy things until a priest stood up with Urim and Thurman. The whole assembly numbered 42,360 besides their male and female servants, who numbered 7,337, and they had 200 singing men and women. Their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, their donkeys 6,720. 6, Some of the heads of fathers' households, when they arrived at the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, offered willingly for the house of God to restore it on its foundation. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury for the work 61,000 gold drachmas and 5,000 silver minas and 100 priestly garments. Now the priests and the Levites, some of the people, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants lived in their cities, and all Israel in their cities. So how valuable with singers, 200 of them, two hundred of them, just amazing, you know, so it's like that's such a gift, and then everyone just bringing their treasure and working toward getting the foundation laid. Uh, Ezra 3. When the seventh month came, and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. So seventh month is like confession, Yom Kippur, and booths, you said? Yeah, and so what month is it right now? Like, what's the date? So we're basically at the one year anniversary of the invasion of Gaza and the Muslims, that continued problem coming in and 
just um, just killing and murdering so many people in Israel and creating such problems. Um, so we're coming up on that time period again. It's a little bit later this time. I think Yom Kippur is October 10th and um, Festival of Booths October 6th. We'll have a, I have a slide on the exact dates. But we're, on, we're in that season right now. So it's, inter it's interesting or amazing, really. God brought us to Haggai, the honoring and the restoration of the festivals and solemn festivals to the Lord. And the name actually means solemn festival. And he brought us to that book right at this time period. All right. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. And they kept the feast of booths, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule, as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings of the new moon, and all the appointed feasts of the Lord, and the offerings of everyone who made free will offerings to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer offerings to the Lord. But the foundations of the temple of the Lord were not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters, and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and Tyrians, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea, to Joppa, according to the grant they had received from Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, in the second year, after their coming to the house of, the, house of God in Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, made a beginning, together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed Levites, from twenty years old and upward, to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Jeshua, with his sons and his brothers, and Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of the Lord along with the sons of Penadad and the Levites, and their sons and brothers. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord, according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of the house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy. And the people could not distinguish the sound, the joyful shout, from the sound of the people's weeping. But the people shouting, shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. So did you catch that? The sons of Asaph? Have you heard this before in, in the Psalms? For he is good, his loving kindness upon Israel is everlasting. You heard that before in the Psalms? Temple restoration began in uh, verse 8. You recognize this? Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Zerubbabel, Josedach and the rest of their brothers and priests and Levites, all who came from captivity, began the work appointed for the Levites. Do you recognize those names? So we're literally living out the book of Haggai. And then they instituted the solemn festivals and even the festival of the booths. But um, apparently, according to the book of Nehemiah, they didn't keep it going. So there was a revival here, and there was cooking. They were cooking, singing. They were honoring the Lord, and they were serving God with their hearts. 
as inspired by the prophet Haggai, who spoke to Zerubbabel and Joshua. And going back to verse 2, the Joshua, the son of Je uh, Josadak and his brothers and chief priests, as Rubel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brothers arose and built the altar of the God. So we're literally living out first in Haggai 1 and 2 right now. Um, Ezra 4. Oh, but when they laid it, there was weeping from the people who had seen it, the temple and the glory of the temple. And then there was shouts of joy. So were they mourning because of their getting punished and all their sins and repentance? Were they weeping in joy? Probably both, you know. All right, Ezra 4. Now the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel. They approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. And we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esarhaddon, the king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of fathers' households in Israel said to them, you have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God. But we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. In all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia, and in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Artaxerxes, Islam and Mithridath and Tabil and the rest of their associates wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. The letter was written in Aramaic and translated. Rehum, the commander, and Himshi, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, as follows. Rehum, the commander, Jimshi the scribe, and the rest of their associates, the judges, the governors, the officials, the Persians, the men of Iraq, the Babylonians, the men of Susa, that is the Elamites, and the rest of the nations, whom the great and noble Osnapper deported, and settled in the cities of Samaria, and in the rest of the province beyond the river. That is a copy of the letter that they sent. This is a copy of the letter that they sent. The Artaxerxes the king, your servants, the men of the province beyond the river, send greeting. And now be it known to the king that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations. Now be it known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and the walls finished, they will not pay tribute customers whole, and their royal revenue will be impaired. Now because we eat the salt of the palace and it is not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor, therefore we send and inform the king, in order that search may be made in the book of records of your fathers. You will find in the book of records and learn that this city is a rebellious city, hurtful to kings and provinces, and that sedition was stirred up in it from old. This was why the city was laid waste. We make known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls finished, you will then have no possession in the province beyond the river. The king sent an answer to Rehum the commander and Shimshay the scribe and the rest of their associates who live in Samaria and the rest of the province beyond the river greeting. And now the letter that you sent to me has been plainly read before me. And I make a decree, the search has been made, and it has been found that this city from of old has risen against kings and that rebellion and sedition have been made in it. And mighty kings have been over Jerusalem, who ruled over the whole province beyond the river, to whom tribute, custom, and toll were paid. Therefore make a decree that these men be made deceased, and that this city be not rebuilt, until a decree is made by me. And take care not to be slack in this matter. matter. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the king? 
Then when a copy of Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe, and their associates, they went in haste to the Jews of Jerusalem, and by force and power made them cease. And the work on the house of God stopped that is in Jerusalem, and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So, um, Rachel, talk to me a little bit about the bad politics going on here. So basically the other nations, like first of all, they're literally wanting to join them in building it because they like said that their God was their God. But then literally when they're like, no, this is our holy house, our holy time, like we want nothing to do with the other nations since they knew their hearts weren't in it. Um, they literally just like complained to the king and just made up like basically false testament that oh this nation always rises up against kings and they appeal to his you know his wealth and his need for money so they're like hey they're not going to pay tribute so then Artaxerxes stopped it just because like he wanted more wealth basically great um and I would um I would submit to you when you say their hearts you said their hearts weren't in it I would submit to you they were they were literally looking to subvert the work spy on them and look for ways to to break down the work um, and maybe even figure out how to get the well that they, they just bad bad motives all around um, what key word thunders out near the end or what key word just thunders out that should not have happened on, res on the re response of the Israelites work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped so seeking God they get that response um but outstanding answer. I submit to you, if they had continued, they would have sent messengers saying, why do you continue in the work? At that point, they would have been able to submit their response. And um, um, I submit to you, the Lord would have honored that response that they would have written um, to them. So as it stands, knowing they showed a lack of courage and a lack of um, seeking the Lord in how to respond. Subsequently, they just got a completely negative answer at that point. This was not a time... Um, anyway, they, 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 they should have stopped their work. Just like you said. I'm surprised that the prophet Haggai hasn't come up in this because of the it's such a relevant time period, you know, and Zerubbabel and Joshua. Are you guys surprised? Um, Ezra five. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> okay, chapter five. Uh huh. When the prophets. Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo <laughs> prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who is over them. Then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Josadak arose and began to rebuild the house of God which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them supporting them. So God sent Haggai when they were in a lull and not obeying he sent them a messenger to inspire them to, to go with what they should be doing. At that time, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shethar Bozanai and their colleagues came to them and spoke to them thus, Who issued you a decree to rebuild this temple and to finish the structure? Then we told them accordingly what the names of the men were who were reconstructing this building 
But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until a report could come to Darius, and then a written reply to be returned concerning it. This is the copy of the letter which Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shethar Bozani and his colleagues, the officials who were beyond the river, sent to Darius the king. They sent a report to him, in which it was written thus, To Darius the king, all peace. Let it be known to the king that we have gone to the province of Judah, to the house of the great God, which is, build, which is being built with huge stones, and beams are being laid in the walls, and this work is going on with great care and is succeeding in their hands. When we asked those elders and said to them thus, Who issued you a decree to rebuild this temple and to finish the structure? We also asked them their names so as to inform them, form you, that we might write down the names of the men who were at their head. Thus they answered us, saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth and are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago, which the great king of Israel built and finished. But because our fathers had provoked the God of heaven to wrath, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this temple and deported the people to Babylon. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild this house of God. Also the gold and silver utensils of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, and brought them to the temple of Babylon. These King Cyrus took from the temple of Babylon, and they were given to one of those, one of whose name was um, Sheshbazar, whom he had appointed governor. He said to them, Take these utensils, go and deposit them in the temple in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be rebuilt in its place. Then that Sheshbazar came and laid the foundations of the house of God in Jerusalem, and from then until now, it has been under construction and is not yet completed. Now if it pleases the king, let a search be conducted in the king's treasure house, which is there in Babylon, if it be that a decree was issued by King Cyrus to rebuild this house of God at Jerusalem, and let the king send to us his decision concerning this matter. So Shesbazar was just the Babylonian name for Zerubbabel. Uh, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So that's basically Zerubbabel. Um, so look at the nature. Um, Andrew, talk to me about the political nature of how this letter was written versus how the previous letter was written. This one written to Darius versus how the previous was written to Artaxerxes. Yeah, so... Cyrus comes out swinging with God, like, giving him a strength of man, go rebuild the house, super strong start, they go over, get started, have even, like, a financial grant from, you know, the Persians, like, oh, yeah, we'll even fund you, and then, boom, power change to Artaxerxes, they write a letter, super confident, get the back, and then just immediately cut it off, stop anti-Jewish sentiment everywhere, and then boom, switch to Darius, they're like, whoa, we do not want to, like, lose our jobs and our heads and stuff, so we're going to, like, be super careful to write a letter, maybe they, like, won't find the edict from King Cyrus or something, we can maybe, like, hope for that, but, uh, yeah, they wrote a super tentative letter to Darius because they didn't want to risk it, and then he ended up being, like, Oh yeah, we totally found the scroll in Ecbatana, and yeah, you guys are totally cleared hot to rebuild the temple. Okay, well said. Um, very well said. Good summary. All right, here's the deep prayer advanced stuff. After prayer, here's what the Lord gave me. They literally, because they chose, or He knew they were going to stop the work and chose not to continue, with adversity, God allowed a really heavy political letter to be written in a very negative or strong way to Artaxerxes that ended up 
just being a one way written very powerfully such that Artaxerxes is looking not to create waves. He wants stability. He's looking to make keep the nations calm without having to send an entire army and fund a war. And so God allowed that letter written to Artaxerxes to be a powerful one way slam dunk just written appealing perfectly to Artaxerxes' spirit to basically rubber stamp it. Okay. Well I don't want I don't want disruption and mayhem. Stop the work. And I don't wanna, you know, Lou we've we've lost enough funding and I got enough political war. I'm trying to keep peace and, and the entire basically known world of the Middle Earth at this point. You know so then it turns to, um, or the, from basically, you know, the edge of Greece or Turkey all the way down to Egypt, all the way out to almost India, you know, that's like the, the, the center of the world where God had put Jerusalem at the center. Now, when Haggai came and they responded, yes, God sent them. Hey, 70 years up, who had been praying for this? On their face. Daniel. Yeah. yeah. Daniel was just praying for it on his face. And by the way, what did all these kings have as a reference point of God's power? In addition to creation, the flood, Egypt, um, the miracles of the Assyrians getting wiped out by the angel, all the miracles in between... Um, what other miracles do they have current waypoints for in terms of God's power? Like the Assyrians just like thumb on everyone after the powerhouse, then like whole army just gets annihilated, and the Babylonians just probably like waltz into their territory. Like, oh yeah, you thought you were all that in a bag of chips, so like they just saw God annihilate the whole Assyrian army, basically. And um. Amen. In addition to that, um, in Daniel, he literally was killing everyone, couldn't understand the dream, and Daniel literally tells him the dream and interprets it to Nebuchadnezzar. Th they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace. God, maybe Christ himself, or at least a messenger, saved them. They didn't even have smoke on their clothes. And so saved him from the furnace. Daniel got saved from the lion's den. And then they consumed all his adversaries. Um, in, in addition to just Daniel's profound wisdom and ongoing um, ability to um, guide and lead and design. And on and on and on. Even from um, just... So they seen they had seen, and even him t saying power will transition to the Medes Persians on this night when he told him, "What does the writing on the wall represent?" And when they used God's articles, you know, and then Cyrus hearing God, they had all these waypoints on God's power um, relevant. So when. God sent him Haggai, and Daniel had been praying, seven years was up, and, and, and Haggai said, let's start, and they obeyed. I submit to you, here's the deep stuff I prayed about, I submit to you, because of their obedience, God put a fear in their heart, like Andrew was talking about, and they wrote a balanced letter that literally included the most powerful defense that an attorney or counselor could have possibly sent on defense of Jerusalem and literally written in a way that King Darius, who's already primed from all those other events that I just mentioned, knowing the power of God, they literally laid out a case for the Lord and God caused them to write a letter. They didn't forcibly stop the work, A, eh? which is amazing. You know, like previously, they forcibly stopped it, and then they didn't. Um, and they wrote a letter, basically, just really a pro 
God Israel letter that allowed when Darius found the decree and it allowed Darius to find the decree that it would just basically like you said home run slam dunk continue the work at that point but what an amazing difference between letters but I submit to you the deep stuff is if they had obeyed and continued building in the Lord that the, the, the political nature, God can literally, that's how it works. You're like, how? Somebody asked me last night, how can you go and deploy unknown into a country? And how could you establish a practice? How could you establish privileging? How could you even have patients be referred to you? Why would anybody even come? How would that work? And how would all that happen? And I said, you know, um, Basically, if I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me, how are you going to start a practice that's impossible and people come, and if you give them the compassion, passion, excellence, and integrity in Christ, and it's, God, it's God's will, and you honor God and pour into them the living water, people, and God allows it, and you're obeying God, they're they're gonna they're gonna flood in and you're gonna do or you're gonna do whatever God's will is in the living water and the Holy Spirit stream according to Him. But how many times have we seen that miracle occur when we hear God and go and God says do it when it's impossible? How many times have we been in an impossible situation? I mean, how many? Dozens. And every time God does His will, and it's the perfect plan. And He utilizes people get blessed and get to be a part of the plan when they show the courage to do God's will. And when people don't, they end up getting sidelined or crushed or marginalized and eventually judged unless they repent and persevere in Christ. We pray everyone comes to Christ. But to do justice, love mercy, love grace. Walk uprightly in the Lord. Empty of self, full of Christ. You guys ready for good news? Alright, who's got Ezra 6? Which lucky reader? Or fortunate reader, not lucky. All right, Ezra 6. Then Darius the king made a decree, and search was made in Babylonia, in the house of the archives, where the documents were stored. And in Ecbatana, the capital that is in the province of Medea, a scroll was found, on which was written, a record. In the first year of Cyrus the king, Cyrus the king issued a decree, concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let it be rebuilt in the place where sacrifices are offered, and let its foundations be retained. Its height shall be sixty cubits, and its breadth sixty cubits, with three layers of great stones, and one layer of timber. Let the cost be paid from the royal treasury, and let the, let the gold and the silver vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that is in Jerusalem, and brought to Babylon, be restored and brought back to the temple that is in Jerusalem, each to its place. You shall put them in the house of God. Now therefore, Tatnai, governor of the province of Babylon beyond the river, Shether Boaz and I, and your associates, the governors who are in the province of, uh, beyond the river, keep away. Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild the house of God on its site. Moreover, I make a decree regarding what you shall do for these elders of the Jews for the rebuilding of the house of God. The cost is to be paid to these men in full and without delay for the royal revenue, the tribute of the province from beyond the river, and whatever is needed, bulls, rams, or sheep, for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, or oil, as the priests at Jerusalem require. Let this be given to them day by day without fail, that they may offer pleasing sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. 
And also I make a decree that if anyone alters this edict, a beam shall be pulled out of his house, and he shall be impaled on it, and his house shall be made a dunghill. May the God who has caused his name to dwell there overthrow any king or people who shall put out a hand to alter this, or to destroy this house of God that is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, make a decree. Let it be done with all diligence. Then, according to the word said by Darius the king, Tatnai, the governor of the province beyond the river, Shetharbaz and I, and the associates, did with all diligence what Darius the king ordered. And the elders of the Jews built and prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo. They finished their building by decree of God, the God of Israel, and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. How amazing is that? And the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the returned exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. They offered at the dedication of the house of God 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set the priests in their divisions, and the Levites in their divisions, for the service of God at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses. On the 14th day of the first month, the returned exiles kept the Passover. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together. All of them were clean. So they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the returned exiles, and for the fellow priests, and for themselves. It was eaten by the people of Israel who had returned from exile, and also by everyone who had joined them and separated himself from the uncleanness of the peoples of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them, so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Amen. So as they were obedient, as they started obeying the Lord and building, and at the end, end of the 70 years, as God knew their hearts would come and the remnant would come, God then allowed the political nature of the letter to be written and changed the heart of the king to literally unleash the wealth of, the, of their and protection to get this done. And the Spirit of the Lord, because His Spirit returned, so it would have a house, allow them to literally build a temple in four years and complete it. And they got their hearts right and they had joy in the Lord as a result of it all. So looking at the follow-on of Haggai 2 in Zechariah chapter 1, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, does that sound familiar? The word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me. So also Zechariah was brought, as well as Haggai. That I return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you. He wants their hearts. So I submit to you when they return and listen to these prophets and return their hearts, God just opened the door. How are you going to do that? Everyone says, every single person. How do I do that? How am I going to do that? How could I possibly sell everything and just go without a man-made plan? How can we build the temple? God didn't say, ask how. He said, do. And then look at it. He, just, he opened it up because they obeyed. And all the politics fell into place. They were still there. It was still rough. But God allowed it. Return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, and I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But then they did not listen to me or give heed to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? The prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants of prophets, overtake your fathers? 
Then they repented. The current, current day people in the second year of Darius. Then the people repented and said, As the Lord of hosts purposed to do to us in accordance with our ways and deeds, so he dealt with us. They accepted the judgment of God as a holy God, and they repented, and they turned their hearts to him. And then you just saw what happened in Ezra chapter 6. All right, let's pray. All right, Father God, thank you for just opening the heavens and earth. And when they returned and repented and obeyed and turned their hearts to you, just the incredible way you just altered people's minds and hearts, letters, uh, edicts, kings, um, wealth, shook the nations and allowed your house and the way your kingdom is close to go for Christ ministries or as close to biblical as the Bible wants for people to live and, and, and live in you and get to do the work of you in purpose and joy and then the productivity that happens in you, Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now some people who may not be in tune with the Holy Spirit, they use the analogy that, oh, as long as the door is open easily and things are going easy, then it must be God's will. I submit to you, let's review what happened in Smyrna, Revelation chapter 2. What was the result of following God's will to those in Smyrna? Be faithful until... Be faithful until death, but I'll give you the kind of life. They literally, their understanding the Holy Spirit was to be faithful to death and be killed in 10 days. That was what they were ordered to do. And if they obeyed and heard the Lord and went through that persecution and, and being killed, then they would get the crown of life. So it's literally understanding what is the will of God and obeying, good or bad. In this case, though God changed their hearts, their, the, the letter was written, it was a home run letter the best a counselor, if they had hired the top counselor of, with wisdom of the Lord, could have written for the Israelites. And the second one, you know, and then King Darius responded, and, his, and the fact that he was searched and found it, all those things, just God's hand, you know. And the, his spirit returned, the temple being built in that brief period of time. But you just saw in Zechariah, he was also, hey, you guys need to repent, and they did, and they turned their hearts to the Lord. So you see what's going on with the hearts of the people, and then you see God's resultant action. God, knowing the remnant was going to repent, had set all this in motion at that exact time, because a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years, like a, one second, all the time is like less than a second for the Lord. I mean, he can see it all at once, knowing what's going to happen, knowing which of the remnant, knowing how they're going to respond, and therefore choosing the Israelites to be his people, bringing the line from Judah, who he knew the southern kingdom was going to re react more positively than the northern kingdom, brought the line of Christ from that, and everything going to, to make them the people that Christ came from, the ultimate solution, while showing God's power and trying to get everyone to come to God in the meantime, and given that as this holy hill and place, where everyone could come to God or Christ the entire time throughout eternity. Before they came to the promised land, it was literally just walking with God like Enoch or the garden or uh, Noah. And you literally could just come to God. He wanted everyone, obviously everyone, worshiping God. And obviously there was ramifications when you didn't. If you're wondering how it all works. <laughs> Alright, let's see. Let me read the title of the sermon again. Haggai 2, verses 6 and 7. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more in a little while I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all the nations. I will fill this house with 
house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. And I'll add, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And this place will give peace. Now that's referring, it's amazing when you have all the time at once, they literally get peace because of the edicts of the king, but they're also simultaneously talking about Christ gives eternal peace and eternal glory. So literal glory and then Christ, eternal glory, and the new Jerusalem, forever glory. So he literally covers everything simultaneously. One of the greatest struggles people have growing up or in all these seminaries, they want to sell you a philosophy, like a little flavor. Like, hey, buy the orange flavor, buy the red flavor. And that flavor tries to sell you on bottling up what this means and when and where. It, it's not, it doesn't work like that. It's, it's, it's so beautiful. The imagery is so powerful and the spiritual nature is so powerful. And God is so amazing. It all happens at once. He could literally give the entire timeline in one, in one swoop in multiple times occurring. That's the thing about revival and lunar and cycles and seasons. It's like continual revival, always go for Christ. Same theme, same Holy Spirit, same repentance. Same benefits all the time, simultaneously. The Antichrist coming in to try to usurp, Satan trying to usurp, God all-powerful, being in your spirit when he comes, persecution, um, blessing when everyone's going for it. It's, this, it's continual, seasonal until the end. He wants as many people as possible to come. You want to break on the rock, Take, let him take that clay, mold it, make it into something beautiful for the banquet of Christ and be able to have that living water flowing out and utilized in His banquet. Be of the house of the Lord. You want to be of the house of the Lord. And when you're the house of the Lord, you put on that new garment and become part of that house of the Lord and you're a new creation and you work now while you're here and then forever in His capacity, just singing maybe holy, holy, holy. You know, over and over again. What is, what is to come, what will come, what, what was, what is, what is to come. You know, the Lord God, Jesus Christ. So, he'll shake the wealth of the nations once again. He's literally shaking them out when King Cyrus unleashed it. He's shaking it out here in Ezra 6. When they were to, once again reminded to fund it. And let's look at Ezra chapter 7. And the wise men, their gifts. Great, great analogy. Shaking the, bringing the wealth of the nations to the king. <laughs> Ezra 7. Now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra the son of Theriah, Son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahitam, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Marioth, son of Zariah, son of Uzai, son of Bukai, son of Abishua, son of Phineas, son of Eliezer, son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Eliezer went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. So, and they went up. This, this is Artaxerxes after King Darius. So this is another era, another realm. So what we're trying to show is, A, the theme of we need continual, ongoing revival all the time. And also, to fulfill today's lesson, God, I will once again shake the wealth of the nations. So this is, Ezra has a special relationship. In addition to Haggai and Zechariah that we're reading about, Ezra also has a special relationship in what he was bringing to the table. With King, in this case, King, God gave him a special, because of his faithfulness, he got a special relationship with the next King Artaxerxes. Because once Darius passes, you know how Daniel always had to reprove himself, and the Lord gave him an opportunity to reestablish God's power and might with the next king. 
So this is a whole new king, a whole new set of politics, a whole new thought process. This is another Artaxerxes, not the one we talked about earlier. And there went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, some of the people of Israel, and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers, and the temple servants. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the month, of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia, and on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem. For the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. This is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe. A man learned in matters of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, peace. And now I make a decree that any one of the people of Israel, or their priests, or Levites in my kingdom, who freely offers to go to Jerusalem, may go with you. For you are sent by the king and his seven counselors to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and also to carry the silver and gold that the king and his counselors a freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, with all the silver and gold that you shall find in the whole province of Babylonia, and with the free will offerings of the people and the priests, vow willingly for the house of their God that is in Jerusalem. With this money, then, you shall with all diligence buy bulls, rams, and lambs, with their grain offerings and their drink offerings. And you shall offer them on the altar of the house of your God, that is in Jerusalem. Whatever seems good to you, and let your brothers do with the rest of the silver and gold, you may do, according to the will of your God. The vessels that have been given you for the service of the house of your God, you shall deliver before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever else is required for the house of your God, which it falls to you to provide, you may provide it out of the king's treasury. And I, Artaxerxes the king, they get a decree to all the treasures in the province beyond the river. Whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law, of the God of heaven requires of you, let it be done with all diligence. Up to a hundred talents of silver, one hundred cores of wheat, one hundred bags of wine, one hundred bags of oil, and salt without prescribing how much. Whatever is decreed by the God of heaven, let it be done in full for the house of God of heaven. Lest his wrath be against the realm of the king and his sons. We also notify you that it shall not be lawful to impose tribute, custom, or toll on any one of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the doorkeepers, temple servants, or other servants of this house of God. And you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God that is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people of the province beyond the river, and such as know the laws of your God. And those who do not know them, we shall teach. Whoever does not obey the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be strictly executed on him, whether for death or for banishment, or for confiscation of his goods, or for imprisonment. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king, to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors, and before all the king's mighty officers, I took courage, for thy hand of the Lord my God was on me, and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. So even then, the next king, Artaxerxes, Ezra, God had sent Ezra, like Daniel or Nehemiah or Haggai, he had the courage, he developed that special relationship with the king and got his trust, and God shook, literally shook the nations and distributed their wealth, all the wealth of Babylon, anything they could come. So this is how the economy works, can only function, is when money is circulating and it's all circulating for Christ. So if it's all circulating and you have all your businesses and worship and everything being utilized for Christ, and the money circulating to bulls, they're, they're, there's farmers, the farmers are raising bulls and sheep, and they're growing crops, the crops are being distributed, but they're 
their whole purpose is to worship the Lord, serve the Lord, raise up missionaries, share you know, the good news about God and His power and, and, the, and the gospel. And um, the bulls are being used by the priests. The priests are working. I mean, maybe they're working in other stuff. Maybe they're just working in worship. If they're full-time, it's just literally physically, they're like animal, um, you know, prepare. They're preparing the meat. They're preparing the sacrifice. That's very physical work. They're physically having to work. Keep the altar clean. Keep it uh, fueled. Um, keep the everything clean. Making sure to replace things, repair things. Carpentry, masonry, every profession known to man, the, the Levites were, were part of. They got to do it all. Whatever their talents. And then everyone else is maintaining the wall, maintaining houses, building houses, distributing you know, medical, um, whatever, uh, making stuff, manufacturing stuff, sewing, clothes, dyeing clothes, getting the wool, preparing the wool, preparing the meals, raising the kids, educating the kids, <laughs> keeping the kids going in, in, a, in a straight line, you know, to get to school without, you know, <laughs> teaching, you know, beauty, beauty you know, oils, trade, everything is cooking, but it's all for ministry, and everything's circulating, and everyone's satisfied, supposed to be satisfied with what they have, and not accumulating or building barns for wheat, you're using it for the masses, for the poor, for the sick, for the people who can't, you know, the year of jubilee, you're for the festivals, and then God is defense, you're making, you know, defense, building up your defenses, soldiers, training soldiers, horses. There's horses everywhere. There are only a few horses. And now there's people literally in charge of horses and stables and literally taking care of horses and stables and having to feed the horses and groom the horses. Horses' hooves, you know, saddles, leather. I mean, all this stuff is cooking for Christ. And that's when it functions. The whole thing functions when they're raising up disciples on how to do business and how to worship and keep God's law in the business. It's literally go for Christ ministry or biblical ministries. Go for Christ ministries, we'll call it. It works. And look, he shook the nation's wealth and put it into circulation like go for Christ ministries. So as long as you keep going and keep doing revival and keep cooking. In verse 6. Haggai 2, or verse 5, As for the promise which I made you when it came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. His spirit was with him. When the spirit of God is with you, it's cooking. So let's look at uh, Exodus 34.10. making a covenant before all your people, I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among you, among whom you are, shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do to you. Amen. Nehemiah 9.20 Spirit to instruct them, and did not withhold your manna from their mouths, and gave them water for their thirst. Exodus 29, verses 45 through 46. I will dwell among the sons of Israel, and will be their God. They shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So as long as you listen to God and the prophets and revival and go, it's just going to be amazing. Temple restored, health restored, all the wealth is being utilized, not stuffed in a barn or used to oppress or injustice, but being utilized for the kingdom. It's just going to flow in, honor God. God is going to be glorified and he's going to give us the best possible scenario. 
with revival and repentance and returning to God. So we need to continue that. And now he's brought the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who literally came and is the ultimate peace, the signet ring, right? I will give you the signet ring. I will take you, Zerubbabel, the last verse of Haggai 2. Son of Shield, to my servant, declares the Lord. Here, let me read it from verse 20 down. Or verse 19. Is the sea still in the barn? Even including the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree, it has not borne fruit. Yet from this day on I will bless you, meaning as they return immediately. And then let's look to immediate and future simultaneous. Then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. He's not even going to shake. See how he carries the theme? The actual, the spiritual, and the imagery. He's literally playing on the, I'm going to shake the wealth of the nations to fund this and fund it again and again, as you're going to see in um, Ezra and Nehemiah. But I'm literally going to shake everything. So he takes that imagery you think, can that be possible? Can God really be that magnificent in the way he writes and presents his scripture? Can it really be that incredible? He literally is going to shake the heavens and the earth, alluding to the fact that he threw Satan out. And, and, and literally, Satan disobeyed. And the third of the angels went for demigod pride. And, and, and got thrown out of heaven at the, around the throne of God down to earth and they're literally going to be defeated on earth permanently and then Christ returned they're in the lake of fire so literally sh that imagery of shaking literally the heavens and shaking the earth and the earth is shaken up continually not only with the birth pains and the and earthquakes and rivers but literally by Christ himself defeating all of evil and death I'm going to over I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth I will overthrow the thrones of the kingdoms not only men but Satan right all evil I will overthrow the chariots and their riders. You can bring all the forces you can. Gog and Magog, bring them all. I'm going to overthrow it. And the kingdom is going to keep getting turned over. I mean, you're going to have Medes, Persians defeated by the Greeks. And then the Greeks get crushed by the Romans and the Romans get overthrown. And Christ destroys them all during the time of Romans. Overthrow the chariots and their riders. The horses and their riders will go down. Every one by the sword of another. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, on that day. Meaning, the day Christ conquers. I will make you a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. That, that's the ring of power. That, that is the ring of power that Christ says, you're my son, you're literally the face of God. You're my prince of, of king of kings and lord of lords and the power forever in Christ. So as we're thinking about that, let's read Matthew 21, 33 through 46. Okay, starting in 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group to slaves larger than the first and they did the same to them. But afterwards he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. 
But then the vine growers saw the sun. They said, when they saw the sun, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard the, his parable, they understood that he was speaking about them. When they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. So that parable, the Lord sent me that parable to say finish with that. And just reading it again and listening to it again, it sums up everything. Literally, when you're obeying God, and you're humble and righteous and gracious, you literally, the temple's built, the temple has been built, Christ, and you enjoy and use the bounty of the land and the fruit of the land and everyone's getting to enjoy the fruit fruits growing there's rain to grow the fruit the seed you're able to become out of the barn because there's protection and fields and everyone's hearts right you're not greedy you're all working because you're all working as a group as a unit in the house of the lord and you're producing fruit for the house of the lord and, and raising you're teaching disciples and you're teaching people how to Raise the fruit, and God's protecting you, and everything's working, and you're all distributing fruit. And the people that try to do their own system, flesh, greed, pride, being a demigod, um, all those temptations going your way and your plan and dishonoring God and shaking your fist at the Lord, they... The kingdom is ripped out of their hands. They die by the sword or plague or get put in hell and, and miserable and empty. And they don't enjoy sharing grape for an apple, you know, um, or pomegranate or olive oil, like special flavored olive oil, you know, with special flavoring that you cook with or heal, you know. Um, like we just got got to see recently just amazing in that special shot you know and just this is this is how it works when you're cooking with Christ this is go for Christ ministries enjoying the fruit of the Lord fullness in his teaching and enjoying the physical fruits of the Lord unless it's persevere to death and then you will have the new Jerusalem then you have a fruit every month for the tree of life or maybe 12 fruits I don't know how it works but there's 12 fruits you get to enjoy you know from the tree of life this is how it works guys if you're on your own agenda it's pain now on earth delivering pain and then eternal judgment in hell And you may get murdered, but you were died serving the Lord honorably with grace and peace and justice, and then you're with God forever. And you're going to get to see those who are martyred get to the special treatment, special robe, even addressed by, by the Lord and His kingdom. Hey, patience, and you get to see the justice paid out to all those injustice. You get to see you get to be a part of that. Correction by the Lord and justice by the Lord. You get to be a part of that justice paid out. 
praying that they won't have to get justice, praying that they're going to get to enjoy the kingdom, right? But if they're the murderers and those, then at least you get to see those people clean and everything purified and just like it should be. So all that will happen. You know, sometimes people get, you get beat and beat up and killed and stoned and humbled. But there's also those who work for the Lord. You glean the bounty of the Lord. You literally work in the fields, the harvest of fruit. You produce fruit and you get to be a part of God's kingdom working for Him. You know, and the rightness and graciousness and justice of the Lord. And then you get something like that. Working for the Lord, the fruit. When He comes, and you don't know, life's a vapor. When He comes and your tree's evaluated, you better have fruit on it. You better be and that and be able to produce fruit. What could be better than to be able to have a piece of fruit to offer Christ when He comes and you're in front, you're there now, every day, every breath, and at judgment. What could be better? And you have that to offer. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Yeah. And then he turns to you and you get to enjoy a perfectly ripe fig when you're just most craving it and your taste buds desire that so much. You get that delicious fig to share. He's looking at it, trying to see, is there fruit? Are you a fruit producer? Or are you not? He's the temple. That one didn't have fruit on it. That tree did not have, was not producing fruit. So it's only good for kindling. He's not going to force the tree to produce fruit. It's got to dig out, sacrifice, you know, get sunshine, water. It's got to be producing fruit. Which one are you going to be? Joy in God's harvest? Or rejecting God and wasted, wasting rotten fruit at your base or no, no fruit being produced and turn it into that. You're only good for kindling at that point. And life's terrible. Disease, sword, famine. You're miserable. Big hole in your chest. Or being a part of God's kingdom and go for Christ's ministries and the bounty of producing fruit with water and joy and leaves and just picking apples together, walking around as a, as a family unit, enjoying apples and fruit and trees and joy, working together. Working with the Lord, walking with the Lord, sharing fruit together. The perfect, delicious fig. Just right in the right season. Which half do you want to be? All the kingdoms, they would seem so mighty at the time and seem so intimidating. The politics seem. So intimidating. He's going to replace them all. He did replace them all. All things. God is the signet ring. And all kings or kingdoms only exist. And God's presence was there ruling through Daniel when they submitted. And remember, even they had to go, Nebuchadnezzar had to go live like a wild animal. Remember that? 
So, I mean, this is going around. So you're telling me he lived like a wild animal until he acknowledged God, and then he restored him? Yeah, why don't you take the gold and uh, go restore, rebuild it? I think that would be good. Please pray for the kings. Please go honor your God. All these things have been happening while that was going on. You think each of these kingdoms seem mightier than the next? Iron, the speed of, and light, speed of, lightning fast speed of bronze, you know, silver, being able to purify silver, gold. But God carved a rock out of the mountain and sent that rock, beautiful rock, the crown of Christ to destroy and the clay feet it never works out when man only God the hand of God use that stone that stone that cornerstone of Christ he carved out and that is going to just destroy all other that conquers all evil death all other kingdoms You either break on the rock or the rock will, will crush you. So if you hold out on your own agenda, what's going to happen to you? You're going to get broken by the rock. You'll get crushed by the rock. You'll get crushed. If you try to do your own agenda, you're just going to be crushed by the rock and turn to dust. Your own agenda. Doing it your own way, with your own pride and flesh and demigod. Trying to do it yourself, you get crushed. You need to break on the rock. You need to fall on the rock and break on the rock. Fall on the rock of Christ. Repent, fall on the rock, and worship God. Come to God empty of self and fill with Him. Worshiping Him. On your face, just before God, empty, repentant, coming to the Lord. Everyone, revival, fall on the rock before God. Praying before the Lord. And then he'll take those broken pieces of pottery, that jar of clay that, that the God made, and God will start to make something. He'll start to mold you. He'll personally start to craft you into something purposeful and beautiful. He'll take that, what was broken, and form it into something beautiful to be used for the banquet. That living water. And he'll form you into something beautiful and new. He'll restore you into a useful vessel, a new vessel. He was broken for you. He himself Live what you lived. He went through all those temptations. The face of God literally came down and was broken for you, and but was resurrected and restored and conquered all. So God making you into something special. October 11th and 12th this year Haggai the solemn festival for the Lord so repentance is coming and that has huge significance right now because of the anniversary and all the war going on between Israel they're ramping up the war against not only the West Bank and Gaza Strip um, Hamas but they're also Hezbollah against Lebanon and Syria they're taking on Yemen and the Houthis 
and Iran is backing it all, and they're going against Iran now. Iran just shot all the ballistic missiles. Are about to um, retaliate from that, and they're really they're taking they're taking on everything. Plus Russia, Ukraine wars, and all that going on. And then Sukkot, or the Festival of Booze, is from the 16th to the 23rd this year. But because of the way the calendar works that we talked about, it's able to be seasonal, which is appropriate, in the correct season that it's supposed to be. And it just makes sense, right? That's just godly. It actually works out. We talked about Haggai from um, Cog. Festivals, solemn feasts, solemn sacrifice, feast days are that festive. And then you get to be part of the festival once he makes you into living water. And, I mean, he makes you into a vessel worthy to hold that living water. You get to go to the banquet and the wedding feast with Christ and be part of it with the new robe and the new... Um, clean robes you get to join in the banquet you get to dine with Christ and be part of that banquet with Christ as his disciple just like the wedding in, in Cana you literally get to be part of it in the miracles like the wedding feast in Cana that um, where he performed his first very public miracle recorded in the Bible you get to be part of that banquet, part of that wedding. The manna, he's a living bread, just like he handed out and provided the bread to the masses and taught. You get to be part of that, part of that kingdom. And eventually, in his kingdom, at the banquet table, at the feast, at the wedding feast, just worshiping God, honoring God, part of his kingdom and all the bounty and fruits and everything that's involved with that. He's the temple. Christ is the temple. Andrew, you want to close us in prayer? On the first of the month, we talked about um, instituting the Lord's holy days and solemn festivals, just the gravity of all those things um, that are done um, for the Lord. And one of the things He instituted for us is the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Him. And um, so it's appropriate um, this week, um, especially as the day... Uh, 
of atonement is coming this month in the calendar, the Jewish calendar. Um, in order to take the Lord's Supper, you need to make sure you're right with God and clean before the Lord um, so that no penalties are incurred um, with that. Reading from Matthew 26. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. If you need to pause the video and take a minute, just make sure you're right with God. This is, um, this is for believers who have repented, received Christ, um, desired, um, had that desire to then want to be obedient and, and be baptized as a disciple in Christ in the house of the Lord. And you are persevering in Christ right now, and you have um, repented of sin in your life, and you're following and persevering in Christ as a disciple, true disciple of Christ. And this is to commemorate, Jesus said, commemorate his, the last time he broke bread and had wine with him, because he is the living bread that was broken, and he, his blood represents... Um, the fruit of the vine that was spilled for our salvation. This is when he was a signet ring that defeated death and Satan and everything. He was the, resurrected as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords forever. This is, we're to remember that time before he went through that ultimate sacrifice and crucifixion and, and, and final beatings for our sins and atonement for our sins. Now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with his twelve disciples. As they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, that each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, says, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread. Thank you. And after a blessing, Thank you, Father God, King of kings and King of all bounty and bread, and for bringing Christ as the living bread. Like the manna that you sustain them, you are the manna that will be represented in now and forever and in the time to come. You were, you will be, you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He broke it and gave it to the disciples. And said, take and eat. This is my body. And we had taken a cup and given thanks. Thank you, Father God, for sending your Son. And we could see so plainly all that he endured, all the temptations, all the fleshly temptations, desires you conquered, all the miracles you did, and the glory of God, the face of God on earth. And you spilled your blood for us. And you were resurrected, defeated death and Satan and, and evil, and lived forever as a king of kings and lord of lords at the right hand of God. Thank you, Father. And giving thanks, he gave to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins.
But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. All right, thank you, Father God. Just, you're holy, holy, holy. GoPro stop video.